Let us pray. Faithful, loving, and merciful God, even when things look horribly wrong in our lives, you are there to hold us up. Give us strength and show us the way. It is up to us to look to you for those answers. It is up to us to call upon your holy name and have the faith, even if it's only the size of a mustard seed. And you will not forsake us. Help us to strengthen our relationship with you as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson from Lamentations is an absolutely fascinating text for a multiple multitude of reasons. First, Lamentations tells in dramatic and graphic depiction the fall of Jerusalem. It took a year, it took a year and a half before the city walls were finally breached. There was a lack of food that led to starvation and even cannibalism. <coughs> Their last king was imprisoned in exile after witnessing the execution of his own sons, and his eyes were plucked out. <coughs> the temple was first desecrated and then utterly destroyed. The holy city of Jerusalem was left in ruin, with most of the people taken off into exile for forced labor, and then the rest fled to parts unknown. Jeremiah himself, <coughs> who is believed to have written Lamentations, was taken captive in Egypt. And it would be another 70 years before the Jews were able to return to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild the temple once again. You have to remember, it was destroyed by the Assyrians some 200 years earlier. But that's not the only amazing part of this text. Lamentations has a fascinating literary structure. Chapters 1 and 2 have 22 verses. Okay? Chapter 3 has 66 verses. Chapter 4 and 5 have 22 verses each. And on all of that, on top of all of that, there are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. 22, 22, 66, 22, 22. There's an obvious pattern in this scripture, or in this book. And this was done on purpose. And it parallels other books in the Bible, such as Psalms, where the authors also lament over their plights. But this literary tool is used to bring attention to a particular scripture. When the reader sees these types of patterns, they knew that it was extremely important. And there was something that they needed to pay particular attention to. Sadly, the faith of Jerusalem, as seen in our scripture, is blamed on people's sin. People's sin is what's said to be the reason for the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile. And this was a common belief amongst the people uh, <clears throat> when people became so separated and detached from God. And of course, that's what it means. A breaking relationship with God is the definition of sin. And God, of course, according to them and their beliefs, would punish the people <coughs> as a whole. So if you were defeated in battle by a foreign power, such as the Babylonians, it was due to the sin of the nation. This was the same belief that, that said if you were sick or born or became disabled or you had a disease, it was also due to sin, being separated from God. And if it wasn't your sin, then it was the sin of your parents who caused this terrible tragedy upon you and your family. See, being connected to God was to protect you. Being separated from God meant all things, all kinds of things could happen. That break in relationship, and that's what this story tells, 
is that break in relationship with God has serious consequences, not only for you, but for your entire community, if not your entire nation. So what do we do as Christians? I mean, what do we take away from this story about Jerusalem's fall? Well, the obvious lesson is that when you break relationship with God, you might find yourself in a pretty difficult situation. And isn't that true in most circumstances when we don't follow a certain set of morals or ethics or rules for our lives? Isn't that when we tend to get in trouble? <coughs> when we kind of step outside of those ethical boundaries, of those moral guidelines that the Bible clearly sets out for us? Yeah. That's when we tend to get in trouble. It's when we tend to, tend to go on our own. And even in the end, here, even in the end, while in the exile, realizing their sin, the people acknowledge God's faithfulness, love, and mercy. Their city has been destroyed, their temple is in ruin, and they have been hauled off into exile, and they still have faithfulness and love, uh, faithfulness in God and understand God's love. They realize that they have gotten too far away from God and they need God, and God is faithful to accept them back openly and on, openly in, in, with God's love. And they still had hope for the future because, God's because of God's nature, because of what God can do, not because of their own, not their own ability to go back to Jerusalem, but because of God's ability to get them back to their homeland. Remember the sermon in regards to Jeremiah purchasing the piece of land to give the people hope in exile, knowing that they were going to be overcome. And he buys the land in Jerusalem anyway, which was most people thought was a fool's errand. But it showed hope that God will, in fact, return them to the home. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? To rely on God's faithfulness, love, mercy for our lives? Knowing that we make mistakes, we commit sin, and at times we are less than loving. It is who and what God is that makes this world righteous. God forgives us when we mess up. It's who and what God is that makes our lives righteous. Giving us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to nurture us, to slap us in the back of the head every once in a while and say, hey! Get on the right track. Even in the midst of life-changing illnesses, injuries, circumstances, or mistakes, we can rest. We can take a deep breath and rest. And just relax in the knowledge that God is faithful, God is loving, and God is merciful. We simply need to turn to God for our hope, for our future, for our lives. How long will we try to do this all by ourselves? With our own power and with our own human wisdom. How is that compared to God's power and God's wisdom? <coughs> Life can be pretty amazing when we keep that relationship with, strong, with God strong. Even in the midst of great challenges, like the fall of Jerusalem, like the divorce like a death, like financial ruin. God helps us find a way to survive and to thrive and to return home. Home. Remember when things looked the most bleak for the apostles, God did not forsake them even though Jesus was dead. The hope of Easter, the resurrection, reminds us that God can make even the impossible happen. Kind of like this story in which a son talks about his dad and was written by Elizabeth Moreno. It goes like this. Dad was a storyteller. He spoke often about the experiences he had as a young man in World War II. His favorite story, the one he told most often, was about the time and he, that he and some other soldiers captured some German prisoners of war. Dad was part of George Patton's 3rd Army, 6th Armored Division, that landed in Normandy on D-Day. 
Now, a few days after the great battle, Dad and a few members of his unit were on patrol in the French countryside. Walking along a hedgerow, they arrived at a clearing atop a small hill at the same time that two German soldiers did. Quickly, Dad and his fellow soldiers raised their guns. Outnumbered, the Germans surrendered their weapons. We should kill them now, said one member of Dad's unit. After what he'd seen in Normandy, Dad was inclined to agree. This was war, and these were enemy soldiers. But Dad hesitated. He ordered the soldiers to empty their pockets. And one of the, one of the German soldiers held out a string of beads with a cross, a rosary. Dad took them from the soldier, and the sight of those beads made him think twice. He handed them back to the man. And of course, Dad knew how to speak German, so he spoke to the man. He said, pray for the war to be over so we all can go home. The German was surprised. He said, you're not going to kill us? Dad shook his head. Well, if you're not going to kill us, there are some more of us who want to surrender, the German said. Dad and the other soldiers, American soldiers, stood awestruck as German after German came out of their hiding place on the other side of the hill. 37 in all. They left behind their weapons, their machine guns, their heavy artillery, loaded and ready for action. If they had killed the first two men, Dad and his buddies would have been gunned down on the spot. You see, when things look pretty bleak, God's grace can bring us through it unscathed.